Well, a big focus this morning. Over 40 US states are suing Meta platforms and its Instagram unit, accusing them of contributing to a youth mental health crisis through the addictive nature of their social media platforms. In fact, in a complaint filed in the Oakland, California Federal Court on Tuesday, 33 states, including California and Illinois, have said Meta, which also operates Facebook, has repeatedly misled the public about the substantial dangers of its platforms and knowingly induced young children and teenagers into addictive and compulsive social media use. Additionally, eight state attorneys generals and the District of Columbia are filing separate lawsuits in their own state courts, alleging Meta's practices violate state consumer protection laws. So in total, basically, 42 states, including the District of Columbia, filed lawsuits in federal and state courts just yesterday. But if successful, the state's lawsuits could force Meta to change the way it designs and markets its platforms to the public and also lead to hefty fines. Listen in to the official reactions coming in. We are suing Meta, the umbrella company for Facebook, Instagram and other popular platforms for violating federal and state laws, including the following uh, three laws that we're focusing on. The Federal Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, the California's Unfair Competition Law, and California's False Advertising Law. In seeking to bolster profits, Meta has repeatedly misled the public about the substantial dangers of its products. It has concealed the ways in which Instagram and Facebook exploit and manipulate its most vulnerable consumers, teenagers and children. We know, thanks to our investigation, as well as disclosures by former insiders, that the company knows the following. Instagram is harmful to a significant percentage of teenagers, especially teen girls. They have research that found that 13.5% of teen girls on Instagram say the platform makes thoughts of suicide and self-injury worse. That 17% say it makes eating issues worse. And 32% say it makes body images image worse. Meta has internal warnings that certain key features can push users into harmful content. The company knew exactly how these design decisions could and would hook young people to the point of addiction and yet continued to use them and in many cases rejected using feasible alternatives that they knew would mitigate harm to our young people. They did all of this with profit in mind, not people, not young users. There is nothing wrong with looking to make a profit, but we allege in our complaint that Meta's unscrupulous and unconscionable conduct and its campaign of deception in order to pursue that profit has gone beyond what is legally permissible and has contributed to an ongoing mental health crisis among our children here in Massachusetts and, of course, across the country. Meanwhile, San Francisco is one of the U.S. states which has sued the media conglomerate Meta. NDTV's Amrita Gandhi brings us how people in San Francisco perceive the ill effects of social media as well as the latest reactions on the lawsuits. I'm in San Francisco on Pate and Ashbury. San Francisco is known for Victorian buildings, Pate and Ashbury, and also for being home to technology and the birthplace of, should we say, social media. I'm going to talk to people to see what they think about the influence of social media on teenage minds and whether taking such companies to task by the courts, as has been done here by California, is merited. So we're here in California, which is the heart of so many tech companies and social media. Um, what do you feel about young people today, globally, though, all over, all over the world, you say, from Instagram and other forms of social media, especially teenagers? Well, I also think partially the parents are at fault because they work double jobs uh, and don't have enough time and are sort of happy that the children are busy but I'm afraid it turns them into little robots you know that it's not reality anymore that they, they are unable to have real-life conversations uh, conflict resolution that it's uh, all a make-believe and I, I do believe it's uh, very detrimental to the mental health of the young people. I, I mean social media is part of life it will not go away 
So I think it's us as parents who have to educate our children about social media. Give some rules, you know, and, and, and tell them that when, I mean, they, that everything they, they read or listen on, on Instagram, on social media is maybe not true. And when they have, um, uh, I mean, they, they, they need to talk to parents about that. But I mean, that's my. Do you feel as someone who has family and watches young kids with their social media usage, do you feel it's something that uh, can have addictive and potentially harmful effects on teenage minds? Even myself, I find it hard to stop once I've started. And I'm, I'm assuming for the younger generations even more because they start at a younger age. So, yeah, I agree it is extremely addictive and there should be, just as anything that's addictive, they should be controlled over it. I think that it's very important. I think children are spending so much time online that they have a extreme, unrealistic version of what they should look like. Um, that Instagram especially, with the amount of uh, inundated with all these pictures that are unrealistic or things that have been so touched up and and um, in a way that they try to compete with this and also how thin they get, their body image, all of this is something they shouldn't be focused on as much as they are. Instead of just being out and learning how to deal face to face and, and to be able to read body language and interact with people in real time, uh, that is suffering so tremendously that they're becoming very introverted and wanting to achieve what they see, which a lot of times is impossible. We know children have long been an appealing demographic for big business in the hope of attracting them as consumers at a young age. But when they may be more impressionable and solidifying brand loyalty, the ethics kick in. For Meta, younger consumers may help secure more advertisers. It's an open secret who hope kids will buy their products as they grow up. But this complaint clearly asserts that Meta's motive is profit. What's your first reaction to these lawsuits? Well, I feel like firstly that we've had a mental health crisis when it comes to social media for a long time, especially during the pandemic when more and more of our teens, especially as they were getting younger, they were using uh, social media more, especially with Meta and TikTok, like Instagram and TikTok, our, our, our teenagers are using it much, much more. And the feeds that they are getting, I don't know if you've had a chance to, I don't know if you're on Instagram and TikTok, but as a 14 year old parent i see what gets pushed in to their feeds through the algorithms so to me that's really concerning as a parent and as a mental health professional that there's no regulations around what's getting pushed and advertised very early on with these teenagers especially while their brains are growing and there's increasing anxiety already when you're a teenager and to have to deal with that kind of constant social media uh, um, kind of injection just adds to the fuel for our teens right uh, you mentioned tiktok and of course we also have youtube uh, these two platforms right. are already facing hundreds of lawsuits filed on behalf of children and school districts about the addictiveness when it comes to social media as business models are designed to maximize the time that's spent by children mm -hmm. on such platforms right it's dopamine right you're getting a rush i don't know if you go on instagram as an adult for our teens that's their communication method. They are not even talking to each other. They are texting or uh, uh, WhatsApping each other. So that is their world. And how do we, you know, it's not just the parents, but also how does Meta and these big companies also regulate what they are actually churning out to our teens who are very impressionable, but also their brains are growing very quickly. Right. Olash, you had mentioned that there are no regulations on what's getting pushed and advertised. And as we speak, U.S. state authorities are seeking to patch holes that are left by the U.S. Congress's inability to pass new online protections for children, despite years of discussions. Yeah, and I'm not an expert on like what the regulations are, but you know, as a parent and as a mental health professional, when I'm looking at the contact content with the teens, my clients and my own child, I'm seeing that what is getting regulated or is it that teens are so savvy now they're able to kind of bypass 
a lot of these kind of like rules and regulations that are or stipulations that are put in place. For example, was I think TikTok or Instagram, one of the companies put like, you know, you have to watch a video. But our kids are so savvy now. They can bypass that. So how do we make it even more kind of stringent so that our teens are being kept safe, especially with the increase in anxiety and depression, and especially body image is so huge right now in social media. I call it doom scrolling, when you're looking constantly at these feeds and the algorithm is really shifting to feed more of that data to our teens. Absolutely, and the filters don't help at all, Parmesha, right? Uh, of course, uh, those pictures are uh, in fact uh, filtered, but some of the charges include collecting the personal data of its youngest users without the permission right. of the parents. Can we, going forward, expect more age-appropriate standards when it comes to such platforms that are used by teenagers? I hope so. I mean, that would be my wish as a mental health professional and as a parent of a teenager. But I wonder how that gets regulated in the United States, like you were saying, or, or any country when profit is the number one margin. And so it's not just one state or one country that has to regulate it. I wonder, like, collaboratively and collectively, as a world, we have to be much more on it because it's not just the United States, it's other countries like the UK and India, I'm wondering as well, that for teens that's getting, you know, we're having similar issues. Let's get you a quick update as far as the Israel-Hamas war is concerned. Well, the UN chief has said he is deeply concerned about the clear violations of international humanitarian law that we are witnessing in Gaza. Israeli diplomats have responded angrily after Antonio Guterres also suggested that the Hamas attack on Israel did not happen in a vacuum and Israel has demanded the UN chief's resignation. This as more than 200 hostages abducted by Hamas continue to be held in Gaza. Four have so far been freed as we have covered. Israel continues its heavy bombing of Gaza. And the Hamas-run health ministry says that almost 5,800 people have been killed since the 7th of October. It's also important to note that while countries like the United States, Australia and Canada have called for humanitarian pauses, they have stopped short of publicly advocating for a ceasefire. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, and those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. For those actively engaged to avoid an even greater humanitarian catastrophe and regional spillover, it must be clear that this can only be achieved by putting an immediate end to the Israeli war launched against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Some of my colleagues spoke to me about the pain and anger of the bereaved families. Every family in Gaza is a bereaved family. No one is spared. No one is safe. Where is the solidarity with them? Where is the empathy towards them? Where is the outrage for their killing? If these expressions are genuine, they cannot be accompanied by excuses for the killer and reasons for him to continue the killing. And Israel stepped up bombardment ahead of an expected ground invasion amid the rising death toll and the collapse of health services in the Gaza Strip. Fears of a wider war have increased after the U.S. beefed up its ground troops and also sent two top military advisers to Israel. Here's our report.
Palestinians gathered on Tuesday to protest French President Emmanuel Macron's visit to Ramallah and his meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Now, Emmanuel Macron, on a two-day visit to the region, early also met with families of hostages that are held captive in the Gaza Strip by Hamas and also held talks with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And a number of Palestinians injured in the latest Israeli airstrikes arrived at the Indonesia hospital in Gaza City, as you can see on your screens. This video, filmed by a local, showed a number of young children being brought to the facility, as well as several adults as well. Welcome back. In Maharashtra, the rival factions of the Shiv Sena, led by Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde and Uddhav Thakre, showcased their strength at competing the Shara rallies. In an attack against his former boss, Uddhav Thakre, Chief Minister Shinde said, those who claim to be Bala Sahib's successors, let them take a look at their own conduct. If I have become CM, has anything changed? I am still a party worker. These are Mr. Shinde's words. But the Dashera rallies this year have carried a distinct importance for both factions as they mark the final such gatherings before the upcoming Lok Sabha elections scheduled for next year. Listen in to what Uddhav Thakre and Eknath Shinde had to say. <laughs> अशी परिस्थिति निर्माण झाले लिया अनि जाक शिवतीर तावर गर्व से कहो हम हिंदू ऐसा नारा दिला कि तूने आज गर्व से हो कहो हम कांग्रेसी है गर्व से कहो हम समाजवादी है गर्व से कहो हम हिंदुत्व विरोधी है अशे वक्त वे होता है काय अपेक्षा करना हिंदू रुद्र सम्राट बोल रहे होते कि देशाला एका मजबूत सरकार ची गरज है तो मजबूत सरकार अपन बगीत लो नौ वर्ष पाई लो मैंने माला आज सुधा आठ होते हैं कि चौदह साली जावड़ेला प्रणव दा राष्ट्रपति होते ते वह आमी सगड़े आता वेड़गड़ आमी गेलो तो सगड़े पक्ष मिलों अने आमी सांगे प्रणव मुखर्जी खुश जाले माला आमला मंडले इतने पंचुस्ती स्वर्षानंतर एका पार्टी से सरकार आला आता देशा मरे स्थायी रे कहाँ याले तुम ही संगा अन्य मनुन माला आज असो आट्टा कि सरकार तो बदल ला पाई जाए इस पर आता जे सरकार आना ही चाहे ये सरकार मजबूत जरिया आसला तरी एका पक्ष ऐसा बहुमत आसले ला पांचवी स as always, news and updates continue here on NDTV. For now, we're slipping into a very short break. Welcome back. The Prime Minister was at the Dasera celebrations at Delhi's Ram Leela Maidan in Dwarka, addressing the gathering after the Ram Leela performance. He touched upon the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, saying that we are fortunate to see its construction after a long wait and just few months are left. In fact, he also hit out at the opposition during this occasion and in the election season. He said some people are trying to divide the country along the basis of caste. The opposition, as we have been reporting, has been pushing for a caste census. Here's what the Prime Minister said. <laughs> कि हम भगवान राम का भव्यतम मंदिर बनता देख पा रहे हैं और अयोध्या की अगली रामनवमी अगली रामनवमी पर रामलला के मंदिर में गुंजा हर स्वर 
पूरे विश्व को हर्षित करने वाला है आज रावण का दहन बस एक पुतले का दहन न हो ये दहन हो हर उस वृत विकृति का जिसके कारण समाज का आपसी सौहार्द बिगड़ता है ये दहन हो उन शक्तियों का जो जातिवाद और क्षेत्रवाद के नाम पर मां भारती को बांटने का प्रयास करती In other news, a day after his request for a voluntary retirement came through, VK Pandian, former private secretary to Odisha Chief Minister Navin Patnaik, has been given a cabinet minister rank in the state government. Now, since 2011, Mr. Pandian has risen as the most trusted aide of the BJD chief. Here's a report on why he is being considered Navin Patnaik's political heir. We must have heard about the Kalinga Cup football, na? Yes, yes. we're planning to start. Maybe. The all-powerful bureaucrat in Odisha, V K Pandyan, private secretary to Chief Minister Navin Patnaik, has taken voluntary retirement ten years ahead of schedule. The timing of his retirement, just ahead of the general elections and assembly elections in the coastal state, has triggered a major political buzz. Pandyan, a native of Tamil Nadu, began his service in Odisha in 2002. He graduated from the Indian Agriculture Research Institute and joined the IAS in 2000. Pandyan served as the district collector of Ganjam from 2007 to 2011. Chief Minister Patnaik was the MLA from Hinjil constituency in Ganjam district five times. From Ganjam, Pandyan joined as private secretary to Chief Minister Patnaik in 2011. Samastang namaskar. After serving as private secretary to Chief Minister Patnaik for 12 long years, Pandyan sought voluntary retirement citing personal reasons on the 20th of October. The center approved the request in a flash within 3 days, waiving off the 3 month notice period. A day after, Pandyan was appointed the chairman of the five transformational initiatives flagship program of Navin Patnaik with a cabinet rank. As district collector of Ganjam Pandyan caught the attention of Chief Minister Patnaik and climbed the ladder swiftly to become his private secretary as his aide Pandyan gained the trust of the chief minister so much that the opposition parties dubbed him the de facto chief minister Manyo Mukhi Mantri aasha kar chuki eta ko IIT NIT ko bola kar liya His recent whirlwind tours to overseas state government programs and schemes in seven districts without the chief minister came under sharp criticism from both the BJP and the Congress. The BJP even trained their guns at Chief Minister Patnaik alleging in Odisha the cart is ahead of the horse. Which side will go? I think that side. That side. Sources say Pandyan will be inducted into the ruling party in Odisha soon and will be given an important position ahead of the elections. With the chief minister's ailing health, Pandyan is tipped to run the show in the party with Patnaik's blessings. An NDTV bureau report. Well, switching tracks, Information Technology Minister Ashwini Vaishnav has written to BJP MP Nishikant Dube over the alleged parliamentary login sharing by Trinamool Congress MP Mahua Moitra and said the matter is of grave importance. The National Informatics Center, he said, will cooperate with the Parliamentary Ethics Committee to investigate this specific matter. But Mahua Moitra has hit back on social media, saying she's amused by the minister's response. She added that she is also waiting for a probe to begin on the BJP MP over his alleged entry into the airport ATC room. Ms Moitra also alleged there was contradiction in the BJP MP's version and the IT minister's statement on NIC involvement in this very probe. Maria Shakil reports. 36 hours before the ethics committee of parliament will meet uh, where they will be recording evidence that will be provided by bjp leader nishikant dubey and advocate jay dehadri the war of words has intensified with mahua moitra coming out all guns blazing saying that why is there no counter probe against uh, the mp who questioned her which is nishikant dubey this coming at a time when uh, the it minister ashwini vaishnav has responded to nishikant dubey 
his letter in which he had said that why are Mahua Moitra's uh, uh, login ID and password not being investigated because he said that it was being misused by uh, Darshan Hiranandani for posting questions on behalf of the MP because he wanted to target business group, uh, uh, Gautam Adani's business group, that is Adani group. In fact, uh, Ashwini Vaishnav in his letter uh, to Nishikant Dubey has said that the issue raised in your letter are undoubtedly of great uh, grave concern and the subject matter will be taken up uh, by the ethics committee. Uh, he also says that NIC, which stands for National Informatics uh, Center, will be uh, responding to any instructions that will be given to them from the Lok Sabha Secretariat and they will be fully cooperating with the Ethics Committee of Parliament which is investigating it. Now it remains to be seen what next in this entire investigation. Remember there is a petition which is before the Central Bureau of Investigation which is yet to be uh, taken to any uh, direction because uh, it's similar to what happened in 2005 first uh, it was uh, the Lok Sabha Committee which was under Pavan Kumar Bansal which investigated the role of various MPs which then submitted its report to the parliament and then the parliament uh, expelled those 11 MPs who were seen in that sting operation of cash for questions. Now um, in this particular case also uh, the CBI is waiting for, uh, for an instruction to come uh, from the Lok Sabha uh, because this is in the domain of privileges that MPs enjoy. Um, remember there has been also a movement which has happened with and Shikan Dube appear, uh, you know, uh, uh, uh sending a letter to the Lokpal as well. Uh, so it remains to be seen what really plays out on 26th now when the Ethics Committee of uh, Parliament will have its first hearing. Let's turn our attention now to the latest study that's just been released. In the post-pandemic India, there is a glaring gender gap at workplaces and the share of women in managerial roles has declined. Sakshi has more on this latest study. Gender inequality at workplaces only seems to have worsened post the pandemic. As per the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's latest data, men account for over 80 out of 100 managerial roles in India. And believe it or not, the share of women managers or women in leadership roles has dropped to 15.9% in 2022 versus 16.9% in 2019 as per the study conducted. Now, India has seen one of the largest drops in the share of women managers. Remember, the Companies Act 2013 makes it mandatory for listed companies to appoint at least one women director. Remember, this study comes at a time when gender pay gap concerns are already on the rise, with women on average being paid about 20% less than men globally, as per the International Labour Organization, and the average gap for India is far wider at 34% as per this study. And let's revert to the top story we are tracking. Over 40 US states are suing Meta platforms and its Instagram unit, accusing them of contributing to a youth mental health crisis through the addictive nature of their social media platforms. In fact, in the latest complaint filed in the Oakland, California Federal Court just yesterday, 33 states, including California and Illinois, have said Meta, which also operates Facebook, has repeatedly misled the public about the substantial dangers of its platforms and knowingly induced young children and teenagers into addictive and compulsive social media use. Now, additionally, eight state attorney generals and the District of Columbia are filing separate lawsuits in their own state courts, alleging Meta's practices violate state consumer protection laws. So, in total, as we speak, 42 states, including the District of Columbia, have filed lawsuits in federal and state courts. Now, if successful, the state's lawsuits could force Meta to change the way it designs and markets its platforms to the public and also lead to hefty fines. Listen in to the reactions coming in from officials. We are suing Meta, the umbrella company for Facebook, Instagram and other popular platforms for violating federal and state laws, including the following uh, three laws that we're focusing on. The Federal Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, the California's Unfair Competition Law, and California's False Advertising Law. In seeking to bolster profits, Meta has repeatedly misled 
the public about the substantial dangers of its products. It has concealed the ways in which Instagram and Facebook exploit and manipulate its most vulnerable consumers, teenagers and children. We know, thanks to our investigation, as well as disclosures by former insiders, that the company knows the following. Instagram is harmful to a significant percentage of teenagers, especially teen girls. They have research that found that 13.5% of teen girls on Instagram say the platform makes thoughts of suicide and self-injury worse. That 17% say it makes eating issues worse, and 32% say it makes body images image worse. Meta has internal warnings that certain key features can push users into harmful content. The company knew exactly how these design decisions could and would hook young people to the point of addiction, and yet continued to use them, and in many cases rejected using feasible alternatives that they knew would mitigate harm to our young people. They did all of this with profit in mind, not people, not young users. There is nothing wrong with looking to make a profit, but we allege in our complaint that Meta's unscrupulous and unconscionable conduct and its campaign of deception in order to pursue that profit has gone beyond what is legally permissible and has contributed to an ongoing mental health crisis among our children here in Massachusetts and, of course, across the country. Now, San Francisco is one of the U.S. states which has sued the media conglomerate Meta. Amrita Gandhi brings us how people in San Francisco are currently reacting to the ill effects of social media and the latest lawsuits. Listen in. I'm in San Francisco on Peyton Ashbury. San Francisco is known for Victorian buildings, Peyton Ashbury, and also for being home to technology and the birthplace of, should we say, social media. I'm going to talk to people to see what they think about the influence of social media on teenage minds and whether taking such companies to task by the courts, as has been done here by California, is merited. So we're here in California, which is the heart of so many tech companies and social media. Um, what do you feel about young people today, globally though, all over, all over the world, you say, from Instagram and other forms of social media, especially teenagers? Well, I also think partially the parents are at fault because they work double jobs and don't have enough time and are sort of happy that the children are busy, but I'm afraid it turns them into little robots, you know, that it's not reality anymore, that they, they are unable to have real-life conversations, uh, conflict resolution, that it's uh, all a make-believe, and I, I do believe it's uh, very detrimental to the mental health of the young people. I, I mean, social media is part of life. It will not go away. So I think it's us as parents who have to educate our children about social media, give some rules, you know, and, and, and tell them that when, I mean, they, that everything they, they read or listen on, on Instagram, on social media is maybe not true. And when they have, um, uh, I mean, they, they they need to talk to her parents about that. But I mean, that's my. Do you feel, as someone who has family and watches young kids with their social media usage, do you feel it's something that uh, can have addictive and potentially harmful effects on teenage minds? Even myself, I find it hard to stop once I've started. And I'm, I'm assuming for the younger generation, it's even more because they start at a younger age. So, yeah, I agree. It is extremely addictive. And there should be, just as anything that's addictive, they should be controlled over it. I think that it's very important. I think children are spending so much time online that they have a extreme, unrealistic version of what they should look like. Um, that Instagram, especially, with the amount of uh, inundated with all these pictures that are unrealistic or things that have been so touched up and and um, in a way that 
they try to compete with this and also how thin they get, their body image, all of this is something they shouldn't be focused on as much as they are. Instead of just being out and learning how to deal face to face and, and to be able to read body language and interact with people in real time, uh, that is suffering so tremendously that they're becoming very introverted and wanting to achieve what they see, which a lot of times is impossible.